Okay, we're live. We're alive. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Joaquin Milara, and I'm the founder of the Swarm Community. With me today is Margaret Warren, and she's also uh, she's the founder of Metadata Authoring Systems, Mass. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about um, who you are and the work that you do at Mass? Hi. Yes. So, uh, yeah, I do a lot of things. Uh, with metadata authoring systems, what we're uh, interested in doing is building tools that um, have to do with image description and knowledge graphs and metadata. And we're very interested in precise metadata and precise, precise description about images, really. So. Uh, and we also make all kinds of other tools around that, tools that help with data set building, that help with knowledge graph building. But it's all the main, the central focus is all around images, although our tools can often work with other assets as well, other types of resources as well. Um, you know, audio files, video files, although we to just a disclaimer, we don't get into um, doing like semantic annotation of frames in videos, but we do more metadata around the um, authoring of the provenance and the descriptive descriptive data of a video, maybe, if that's if that's what we're going to do with video. We, I mostly focus on images. Um, I am also a research associate with the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition and have done a few interesting projects there over the years. And I am a... Um, I'm also an artist, and so that perspective informs a lot of my viewpoint around images on the web and how they should be shared and published and what can be done with them once I've created them and so on. And so, uh, so I'm concerned about a lot of these topics. I'm also on the... Um, board of the, I'm on the, not on the board, sorry. I, I'm on the photo metadata working group for the um, International Press and Telecommunications Council, IPTC, um, uh, working group for setting the standards on the type of embedded metadata that goes into images. Uh, I participate um, a little with the uh, groups that are looking at with the with the c2pa and the content authenticity initiative and i do some other things like i am a um i'm a tech technical advisor for a really interesting new startup called photo f-o-t-o and it's a social media sharing app for photography and so and there's a few other dozen things that i do too as well <laughs> but that all revolves around image and precise image description Great. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, Margaret, we've had a few opportunities to talk, and uh, we also recorded a podcast where we covered a lot of the, the things that we're going to talk about today. Hopefully, we can cover some new ground so that the audience can get some fresh content. Um, but uh, I think that we're aligned in it that we're seeing such an explosion of synthetic imagery. We're seeing copyright issues. We're seeing. Um, the importance and and the the need for um, properly embedding metadata instead of imagery, so that we can have a richer world where we can, you know, identify what is what and and where does it belong and how do we use it and how do we retrieve it. Um, one of the key areas that we spoke about, and and it's part of your passion um, as as something that you do in the side is how do we identify car parts and ensure that we can uh, know where they where, where they come from, who manufactured them, what cars they belong in, and if they're discontinued for manufacturing. There's so many things that uh, we take for granted in the world of imagery, but have such a big implication in our lives. We wouldn't be able to live without eyes. How can we imagine a world without being able to see? Well, actually, let me let me jump in here and say actually we can. There's there's an awful lot of people who who are, who function great in a That's world without right. eyes. So uh, I'm big shout out. I know um, I think uh, a friend of mine, uh, Carolyn uh, Derosier, who works on accessibility, 
and tagging and, and creating alt text, really good alt text for imagery is, um, you know, maybe she said she was going to maybe show up for this, um, for this session. But um, so I'm giving a little shout out to her too. Um, the, um, so yeah, so, so people do in fact, and then that's actually a really interesting point. We, we say, you know, we do sighted people rely on visual image information a lot and that's pretty obvious but you know there is a, an awfully big world out there for people who have sight issues um and and um you know uh that is another uh goal of mine is is that by using really deep description about images and that it is attached to images and travels with images in a workflow that data then is available for people to use who are who need um, who need more information to go with imagery. I mean, you know, this is almost a topic in my mind for an entire session because, you know, I <laughs> sometimes you know I get confused. I'll be going through Twitter or something, and I'll see a meme, and I have to sit there and really concentrate on it and think, what is this mean like what is the relevance of this to the world like what you know what is the joke or what's the where's the irony and and it takes like a, a lot of knowledge of like the visual visual cues as well as the text that is usually on the meme and it's very complicated to understand I know that at one point in time even there was a program that was that where Carolyn was translating um memes for a for an audience that was not cited, so they can get some of the memes. But anyway, there's an awful lot of visual imagery on the web in general that is confusing. And as a cited person, you understand why it's there. You can see like some embellishment or some shape or some little icon or some little thing and it's off to the side. And we learn how to filter that information out so that we only concentrate on what we need but you can just imagine the importance of having that that visual information actually, you know, identified correctly, so that if a an, a not sighted person is using the web, they can kind of skip past all that, you know, and get to, you know, what is what am I supposed to be getting off of this from this web page? I mean, the worst part is that we live in an age where there's almost nothing we can do without having the web now. If you want to go and use, you know, government services, you need to have, you need to access the web. So it really needs to be accessible for all. So sorry to get off on that little tangent based on your <laughs> comment about that. But, but um, I, I kind of had to give a big plug for my passion about accessibility as well. So. I appreciate you, 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 rounding out that uh just dro dropping in that that statement you're right um other people do see the world in different ways and you, you also mentioned um accessibility there, there are neurodivergent neurodivergent people that interpret the world in different ways uh -huh. um and being able to make it um accessible for them as well in, in the literal sense like this is not to be meant this is not meant to be taken seriously or this is not meant to be interpreted in these ways um it's important to have those parameters around imagery as well because uh we interface with computers we gather information that informs our behavior if we don't really know that something is a a joke or satire we may make false uh actions or or, or we may take actions that are harmful to ourselves or others um out of, out of lack of knowing yeah lack of knowing knee-jerk reactions uh, too, you know, very divisive, you know, that's, you know, this has plagued us now for a while with, with social media is just learning how, how quick we are to process certain information and then sometimes process it hastily or incorrectly. And it's even worse when it's deliberately, you know, created misinformation so that you are, you know, visually sort of bombarded with things that you're, you may find really um, abhorrent and then you uh, feel like you have to react to it right away. And then after a couple of hours, you think about it and you think, well, 
I get where they were coming from now. I didn't, I didn't really understand where that person was coming from. And, you, you know, so yeah, visual information is big. I mean, it causes us a lot of, a lot of, um, you know, um, uh, it can cause a lot of, of, uh, divisiveness and uh, other things yeah let's let's talk a little bit about artists and data sets for generative ai i think that's a hot topic and i think it's something it's that's both on on both our minds um mm -hmm. where do we where do we start um where do we start well um i watched a, a wonderful talk i i kind of mentioned it in my it last week about um uh, the difference between archives and data sets. And I'll, I'll leave that to the person who created the, the present, the wonderful presentation. Uh, his name is Eric Salvaggio and uh, he did a presentation for Wikipedia group last week that I found uh, really inspiring. Uh, just the way he framed a lot of the, a lot of the aspects of it. You know, the most important thing is that, Our, what a lot of these companies have trained on and the way they have evolved, the, the companies that are working with the neural nets, the LLMs, the generative AI, it's kind of a natural, you can see the natural evolution over the last 20 years, how it started sort of innocently let's see if we can take a hundred thousand images and find the cats in those photos. And that has just evolved um, just over time. And there's, you know, many people in this, there's been many people in this pipeline that have gotten us to this point and not, no one's, you know, there hasn't necessarily been any evil intent, I think, until we've now gotten to this point where we're, able to generate these images that are stylistically very much like uh, what, um, you know, artists who spend a lot of time and energy learning their craft. Uh, and, and now these, these machines can just emulate these so rapidly. So you have situations, I saw one great example this morning, in fact, which is that you um, can now create imagery of that looks like an image of an animal that has been photographed in uh, in Africa, and uh, any magazine can now create this within a few seconds, and they don't have to pay the photographer who actually went and sat in the bush for hours and hours and hours to capture this wonderful image of, you know, a leopard with her babies or something, you know? Um, and um, it really begs, you know, a lot of questions about, is that really, you know, um, sort of fair to the artists who, and to the photographers who spent years learning how to do what they do and to create those imagery, this, that kind of imagery. That's one angle. Another angle is that these companies have just used a lot of the material that's available through the common crawl, which is a lot of information that's just been scooped up from everywhere. So you get, you get everything in the data set, you get the pornography, you get some, you know, horrible child porn which i think people have probably seen this lately this is one of the big headlines over the past few weeks is people trying you know frantically trying to figure out now how do we pull out the child porn out of the these data sets um there's um there's a lot of you know garbage uh, that's out there um there's also a lot of really interesting stuff but you know as an artist I made the observation to someone the other day that, you know, if you imagine that you're sort of taking all the pixels that have ever been put on the web and put them into a paint can and you know, turn them into like a paint can, a metaphorical paint can, and then you 
and then you um, you know can with the styles attached to those pixels, you can kind of you know just you know make an image. And um, as an artist, I'm like, I don't want my art to be part of that paint can. I, I, I don't, and, and, you know, even though I may admire a lot of the artists who are in the paint can, I'm not interested in having my art. My art is very personal. It, there's a lot of my personal experiences. I consider it my own sort of, my art is like my own extractive process to sort of like drag my brush through my brain and, and paint with it. And, and, or, but, you know, photograph with it. it, it somehow gets filtered through my own personal expression. And I don't want that going into a data set that is now just going to be dumped in there with a lot of other artists, even if I like their work. I don't want to be alongside because I'm, I've never had the urge to see what would happen if I merged my art with Picasso's art. I, you know, I might want to create some cubist art from time to time, but I like to think that it's my own personal expression, not just, you know, me able to, and maybe I am emulating Picasso in some sense of it, but I think I'm, again, filtering it through my own personal experience and not necessarily um, just, uh, and it's my own imagination. And so. Um, art, art is a creative expression, creative work, and that's intellectual and that belongs to the person that originated it. I don't see, I don't see why it would be um, a free for all. We have a question. Hi, hello. Yeah. Hey, Joe. Uh, thanks for joining us. Yes, uh, thanks for joining. Joe asks, "Hi, Margaret, and everybody. Do you see any sort of regulation coming anytime soon? Particularly considering that the algos are trained on material by existing photographers." I think this is something that's being tackled now, you know, with the court case, uh, New York Times suing OpenAI and other um, providers of intellectual property. OpenAI sort of just scraped the Internet for information, however it could. And it's trained its uh, its its uh, algorithm, its its uh, model on publicly available and private data. Um I think the the EU is also coming up with some parameters on how to uh, reason with not allowing uh, corporations to use private information, such as text or imagery, in in training of uh, of AI. Uh, but what do you think, uh, Margaret? So, I think it's a hard hard topic. I am. I had to laugh because this morning there was a post with an article where, you know, naturally the, the gen AI, gen AI companies are crying. Ooh, hoo. um, you know, well, we can't have a business model if we can't rely on all this free content. <laughs> so, I mean, you see something like that and you're like, well, you know, like, gee, sorry, but, <laughs> um, it, the, we need to, you know, um, there definitely needs to be a way for them to learn to step back and create and pay attention to some mechanism, which, in my opinion, has been there from the beginning that people have ignored and have stripped and have not used. But there needs to be a a way for them to step back to strip out the data and or compensate the uh, the materials that they're using from you know give credit and compensate the materials from which the products their products are coming from how that gets accomplished is a really like difficult topic it's not easy for them to do i can see why they're whining um but you know a lot of days i just think to myself well it's really cool that you made this really neat experiment like it's really neat that this that you can do so much and it can get so good at what it does 
And it's like sort of inventing the copy machine, you know? So we invented Xerox machines and you could go take a book and copy the entire book on a Xerox machine. And as long as I was just going to take it home and use it in my own house, or if I was a teacher and I was going to take it to, to my, to a classroom and give it to, you know, 20 people, that was one thing. Uh, that's where fair use came came into play. But I think that fair use takes on very different connotations now in light of of this uh, the 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 global scale, the scale. yeah the the scale scale. of this process. And uh, I would sure like to see some regulations what I, I think that they may very well come up with regulations. And I do think the EU Act has regulations in it. And even the the thing that the White House came out with, what I forget what it was called now, the AI bill, what what was it? At AI. AI something. Um they they said um, you know, that you must do due diligence to prove that you have uh mm. the uh, access to the materials that you have, that you have the the legal ability to use them. That's actually written already. So that is, you know, just, you know, it's not an actual law or a regulation with penalties, but it is a recommendation, a strong recommendation from, um, from the government that you need to do due diligence. So my question has been, what does that due diligence look like? And I think there's a lot of people sort of sitting on pins and needles waiting to see, is that going to be some sort of a watermark? Is it going to be some kind of embedded metadata? Is it going to be a blockchain solution, some sort of smart contract thing? Um, what is that going to actually look like? That's what where the what the hard question is. So I, I'd like to see it coming. I, I it, you know, it's it's a really interesting precipice that we're on. And also it's it's very divisive. There's a lot of people who just think, oh, content should be totally free. If you put it on the web, it should be completely free. And if you've uploaded stuff, it should be out there, you know, available for anyone to use. And um, a lot of these companies have, you know, um, have written in plausible deniability uh, into their um, terms of use, you know, so um, I mean, in the end, you kind of had to, I mean, you cannot be responsible for what, like if you're a company and you have, um, and you have a set of, a, a set of digital assets, like I, I do, you know, I have, and I have a set of 87,000 images and image snippets. It's a little teeny drop in the bucket compared to the scale that we're looking at. But uh, all of the images that that we put into image tippets have some sort of copyright, both embedded in the image and also attached to the image and linked to a and linked to an RDF um, uh, triple store. Sorry, an RDF triple store. So, uh, so I think there are ways that it can be done. This due diligence. I think they're going to have to take a pause and take a step back. And I don't think they want to do that. And I think there's a whole lot of lawyers and a whole lot of lobbying and a whole lot of, um, of investors who are behind it, who are going to just keep pushing to see what happens. Um, even in spite of the regulations. Uh, so I hope that, I hope that helps <laughs> Joseph. I hope. I hope I um, answered that. Yeah, I think you covered a lot of ground in that. Um, so let's talk about the the work that you have been doing um, as far as your personal archives and, you know, the work that you do for clients. Maybe you can address the, the, the first one and then we'll go into some of the use cases that you, that you tackle on with your practice. Mm -hmm. So uh, my interest in describing images especially with semantic web techniques goes all the way back to sort of the inception of the ideas of the semantic web. And that kind of came about just after, you know, not that long after 
the web really kind of was was taking off there was you know the initial web with html and links and linking to documents and things and then um, pretty soon after that tim berners lee and some other great researchers started uh, saying well the next logical step is that we should have things become have have information that's in web pages become things instead of strings so there's like a great um uh you know some somebody once said if you only have like one like you only need like one definition of who someone is on the web and then you should be able to refer to that definition right i mean this is an idea that there's a, there, there's sort of like one ground truth about certain things. I mean, there's there's a ground truth about what a coffee cup is. And maybe it can look different and take on all different shapes. But generally speaking, we all recognize a coffee cup when we see it. And it pretty much doesn't matter where you're at on the earth unless you live very remotely. And even then, I think there's some version of a cup or what have you, right? So, um, I mean, I don't want to speak for <laughs> every person on the earth, but I think that I think that the idea is that you should be able to say, "I'm talking about a coffee cup." This this is what a coffee cup is. Now, um, or a person. I think a, a friend of mine used the great example, Abraham Lincoln. We all knew know who Abraham Lincoln is. We may disagree on like some of the things that he said politically, or we may, you know very much agree with some of the things he said. We may disagree about some of the points of his, you know, his upbringing, some of the things we've learned from his biography, but we basically all know when we're talking about Abraham Lincoln, who we're talking about. The idea is that the web would have turned into, uh, into the next step where we wouldn't just be linking to documents, but we would be linking to things or to, to names and those names would be grounded in a definition like very much like an encyclopedia so we could all sort of go to the same encyclopedia of course we have you know wikipedia and we have wikidata now we have dppedia we have several different types of organizations of knowledge some different architectures for this knowledge but i got inspired by that back in early 2000. So I was looking at when I put my images online, I said, I want my images to be, I want the image itself to stay connected to me, to my provenance, to when I created it, why I created it, my intention sort of for sharing it. And I want my images to be linked to as many pieces of data as possible on the web that will help give it context, that image, give that image context and be findable for, for search engines. And when I actually started doing this, the, the, um, Google wasn't really even as, it wasn't all necessarily the primary search engine. It, we still had Alta Vista and Yahoo and some other search engines like that, that were competitive with Google. But it just, in my mind, there was this process by which we could describe imagery that we would use knowledge graph techniques, basically, and we would link to these things, and that's called linked data or linked open data. And that would help those images be found and we could ha then have precision about you know, and be able to find those images well and that this would be a great way to share and publish the images so i started with that premise almost you know 24 years ago and i'm i'm still working on that and i still have yet to see solutions that are as uh, um, comprehensive as my vision so um, so I keep working on it. And so, uh, consequently I get to work with a lot of interesting customers 
and who are also interested in sharing and publishing with really precise information. Uh, one of them uh, is a group of people who are involved in early Porsche, rest Porsche car automobile restoration. And um, so, so in that sense, in that uh, domain, where you have some subject matter experts who are very familiar with car engines and car parts, these particular car engines and car parts can describe these parts in great detail. And those descriptions can then be turned into the type of entities that can be resolved. It's, um, you know, there's a, there's a, an idea on the web with linked open data that you can have five star quality linked open data. And that data is that it's, it's open, it's findable, it's interpret, it's 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 interpretable. You have to look at the five different stars. I can't remember what they exactly what they all say next to them, but they but one of them is that basically they are dereferenceable, meaning you can go to a URI and it will it will um, it will um, redirect to a to a URL that will give you a description of that entity. And so, you know, theoretically, then what you are able to do is talk about ex like, ex like images that have very, very um, precise descriptions that would ordinarily be extremely hard to be identified by any computer vision system, even going into the future. I, I, one of the examples we talked about, a few um, weeks ago was this example I shared about an intake manifold. And that intake manifold is a, um, it happens to be extremely rare. The, 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 the example I used was, was a part that it can only, it was maybe made for only about 50 cars. It was for a very, very early 1950 pre-A Porsche, engine 1100 cc engine and it has a particular bolt pattern on this intake manifold and it takes and and so it's it's really interesting to be able to maybe find that particular needle in the haystack of the web right and um but that's something that if i show it to um chat gpt or if i show it it might be able to say it's an intake manifold maybe sometimes it's questionable whether it can say that sometimes i've i've tried it on different days and some days it knows what it is and some days it doesn't <laughs> and um it and it but it even even then it will only know it's an intake manifold it, it may be other it may be sometimes it just thinks it's like curved pipe it it does not necessarily know exactly what it is, and that's the kind of data, the kind of context that you need to um, be able to find these things. And and I feel like going back as far as I do with this, I, I feel like that there were there have always been processes we could have done since the beginning of of you know almost the beginning of the web that would have one made precision you know, made, made precise things much easier to find overall in imagery, as well as the provenance issue. If we had gone about things a slightly different way, things had, the web had gone in a slightly different direction, um, we wouldn't be having the problems we're having now with copyright, um, you know, not being able to be found. I think someone said that, the, that I read an article once that the stable diffusion CEO, I don't know if this is true. I read it in an article. Said what was quoted to say, um, it would be great if there was copyright information embedded in images, but I've never seen, you know, but that doesn't exist. And one, that's just not true. There's been embedded meta, the potential for embedded metadata from the very beginning of the web. It has been stripped, generally speaking. Now, in his defense, I could probably say that coming up in a machine learning environment, he may have, in fact, never seen right. embedded copyright information. But, but 
exists. Nevertheless, the, the ability for it to be there has been there since the beginning. But um, we, we spoke about in the podcast um, about the evolution of the use of imagery um, from, you know, you, you take a, a picture with chemicals to, okay, that picture is labeled for its intended purpose to be part of a story that you're going to print in a newspaper. And there's this uh, sequence of steps in the publishing process that um, take into consideration the use of that image. And you talk about uh, distribution rights, copyright. Um, where did we get lazy? Where did we get lazy? And where did the where did things change? Was it just the advent of, of the internet? We just want to upload the image and be done with it? Shouldn't we have kept some of those uh, procedures that require us to tag and annotate? And Absolutely. I, I think, um, well... <laughs> I make a lot of funny jokes because in my career, I have, um, you know, had all kinds of different um, experiences around what I do. And one of them is, you know, that you use the word metadata and a lot of people either they roll their eyes or they're like, as soon as you say the word metadata, people are like, that's too deep for me. But on the other hand, if I hold up an image, and I say, who took a picture of this? Oh, that was my grandfather. Oh, where was it? Oh, that was in the Pacific Theater in World War at the end of World War II. Oh, well, what's in the image? Well, that was the people in his in his uh, in his um, you know company and what have you. And those were friends of his. And you know, I mean, they can give you all the metadata. They just somehow disconnect that word metadata from all that information and it's really kind of that simple and yet people want to disconnect from that so um you know there were some incidents that happened and i recently had a, a, a great ch a chance to talk to a, a well-known a photojournalist who was active in this space during the transitions between going from the um, from the print world to the online world, decisions that were made about stripping metadata. And I mean, ultimately, it comes down to the decision that I think hindsight is tw always twenty twenty, but there were some incidents that happened where. I think that newspaper staff personnel were putting too much information into metadata fields that was um, that was um, um, what is the word um, it, it, it was it was it revealed too much about a source. Or a you know, or a journalist location, it it revealed it it revealed too much in the metadata, and someone got a hold of it, started publishing about it, it impacted people's careers, so there was sort of a rash to, to, you know decision at that moment to kind of like, well, we're just going to start stripping all the metadata, and this came from a from a you know in in these um, large news publications which was probably just like too too harsh of a choice to make knee -jerk reaction it's a knee-jerk reaction um and um also i think in general um the the sort of lustful appetite of social media companies to get as much engagement and as much data as possible led them to just allow people to upload whatever they wanted with as without metadata attached they stripped the metadata based on privacy concerns which are there are valid privacy concerns but there are also ways to handle that so 
when you have GPS location in there and you're sharing pictures of your child in the playground, we'd like to think that we live in a world where we don't have situations like parents who are divorced and someone's going to try to find out where that child is and then come kidnap that child. We like to think we live in a world where there's no, um, malice. Uh, where, there, where there's no malice or no child pornographers and, and pedophiles. And the unfortunate reality is we found out that we live in a much creepier world than we could have possibly ever even imagined, uh, I guess. And, um, as sad as it is to say that. And so, you know, so the, a lot of the companies just said, well, then we'll just, we'll just take all the, lo we'll take all the metadata out. Well, it, that sort of throws out the baby with the bathwater, in my opinion, <laughs> like, you know, that you, maybe there were ways to make the, uh, that metadata opaque that you mm -hmm. could have made, you know, you could have hidden that location because we do have, and we do have now people who are, they'll tell you everything in their post about where they're at. They'll tell you completely where their location is. So it didn't really matter if that location stayed in the metadata, but in general, we've made it harder and not easier for metadata to be attached to images and to be managed in images and to be managed as part of a workflow. And um, this is, this is um, very sad because to me, because I think there was so much value in the metadata being able to be um, embedded in, in, in images. And I, I feel like we just, you know, yeah, we've we've lost sight of kind of the we've lost sight also of like in putting in a little friction in the way mm -hmm. that we share so that you could think twice about how you share or what you share what you're sharing, why you're sharing it and and you know, maybe we could take a step back on that too, right? I so think, I I, I, you know, this is the second time you say this, and I find it really um, entertaining. Um, the aspect of, oh my God, I don't want to share my geolocation on my phone, but then I'm going to take this picture and I'm going to tell everybody where I'm at. Exactly. I'm doing with who I'm doing it with, and I'm going to tag all the people that I'm with. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's oh, funny. Absolutely. It's, oh, absolutely. It's, I've, seen it, I've seen it happen. You say, do you want to um, leave the ge the uh, geolocation in your image? No, not only no, but yeah. heck no. I want you to never ask me this question again. I want you to remove it from all my images. And then the very next thing is like in the post, you say, we were at the at the oceanfront hotel in in uh, Myrtle Beach on Saturday with and 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 you know having a time of our lives listening to this band and we're going to go see them on, again on on next friday <laughs> at this location <laughs> so it's kind of funny you know um and, and granted i mean maybe you don't need to have gps location in every image that you share uh you know i came from a different perspective about sharing my work online i i always felt that I would share, I always thought, this is kind of funny, I always thought you shouldn't share, you know, this is like something your grandmother would say. I guess maybe I'm now of the age where I'm the grandmother <laughs> saying like, now don't share anything, you know, don't go out without clean underwear or something. It's like, it's like, you know, don't, don't share anything online if you're not sure what you're sharing, you know, like it's, it's kind forever. of funny. Yeah, well, it's because I I used to, you know, I would say to myself, don't share anything unless I'm, unless I would be comfortable standing in the middle of a mall on a Sunday afternoon and telling anybody who happened to walk up and talk to me, you know, some piece of information. That is the kind of stuff that I, you know, 
tell anybody and everybody. And I think that's another odd thing about these social circles is they sort of encourage us to share anything and everything that you might not share. Like if you ordinarily, like you can imagine, I can remember my grandmother, in fact, used to take me down to the, we'd walk down from the house down to the center of town uh on any given weekday you know and there were things that you told you know your immediate family then there's things that you might tell someone who's close friends of the family and then there's some people that might walk by that you may know them or you know them from you know some you know community activity you do like church or a social club or something like that you could tell them certain things you know i think Google at one point had the right idea with their Google Plus and circles, but I think this is like so hard with the web now. Um, I think I, there's I, a lot I, of cognitive struggle when you have to sit and think about who you I, want to share things with. I think what you said in the beginning was very insightful that the incentives are fundamentally different from the organizations and the platforms that host these social networks versus the actual social function mm -hmm. of us as a society. Mm -hmm. Because um, for someone uh, who profits off of advertising and social engagement, um, social discourse and polar po polarization and um, shifting influence of people it's deeply profitable to, to be able to, 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 to uh, navigate the minds of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the whole, like, if you're being able to use the platform for free and upload things, um, you may inevitably be the product. If you're not paying for the product, you may be the product. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I think you mentioned before things were a little bit more uh, safe or there was some sort of like, friction point that allowed you to give uh, a second thought or a third th thought of uh, what is the use, what is the implication, what is the context, and what is the the consequence of me doing this thing online, you know? Now it's just, uh, no, share, share. Hey, share, uh, share, share, for all. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like the, I feel like the news industry <laughs> – Really, I like to use this whole story about sharing. So my father was a photojournalist, and I can remember him being in the in the news. You know, he would go out to an assignment, and he would make images. In fact, I'm working on an archive now of his materials, and I will find something like. In fact, I found images for a 1974 governor's press conference. That was when in, in Tallahassee, Florida, and it was uh, Ruben Askew was the governor. And I think he was seeking re-election for a second term and he was deciding who to choose for a running mate. I think, I'm not positive. It was 1974 governor's press conference. And I found the negatives from that event. And I can see the one that my dad clipped or the couple that he clipped that he felt like were the best ones. Okay, so as the photographer, he went in, he was given an assignment. He went to that to the governor's press conference. He made the images there. He brought them back. Presumably, he and the editors the who were going to run the story um, looked at these and they chose what they felt was the best image. And granted, we know that newspapers have an editorial slant. They have a bias to them. Um, but um, you know, they also were, you know, there was a, there was a certain amount of integrity in this entire process, right? That the photographer went out with the assignment, came back with a bunch of different types of images of that event. The editors and the photographer chose together which of those images would best represent that story. Then they would um, run that story. And when they ran it, it had a lot of information with it. It had the person who had made the image. It had the um, the um, image the caption. Caption. It had the location. It had the date. It had the time. There was a lot of integrity 
it yeah. you could actually see the, the provenance to how that image was made and why it was the image that accompanied the story. And I've been able to go back and even track down these images as they match like the the um the story um <clears throat> In the newspaper, like I can go to newspapers.com, look up that 1974 governor's press conference, found the story, found the image, found the very image that was chosen, you know, in the roll of film. And then there's all these other images around it. So someday there may be someone who's interested in that, right? Who's interested in that, in going back and reviewing that material. Um, so that's kind of my job now as the archivist is to work with that data and to, and to preserve it. But I think what happened is that the news industry just dropped all those habits in a lot of ways. I mean, there's at least what we see visually, I mean, it, it, you know, that we, we um, it, you know, they, they went to more like, more like you would if you were an advertiser. So, so news information became content. And that content became something that would be advertised to get viewership for the newspaper. And so it like shifted to that model. And so, I mean, because I used to, because I made the, the comment before that if you go to, which went into the advertising part of the newspaper, they handled an images completely differently. They would just use stock imagery. So we, you know, to, to illustrate, an advertisement. If it was an advertisement for bamboo mattresses, you use any picture of a bamboo tree. So, you know, like you don't have to put where it came from, the fact that the tree was in, you know, Japan when it was, when they made a picture of it, you don't have to imply that this bamboo came from Japan when it was made into the tr into the mattress, you know, that sort of thing. Like, you know, you don't need the provenance on that kind of stock imagery. And then we, but but when moving to the web, we moved to this mentality that we could just grab any kind of images without metadata and stick them with news stories to make, you know, to be to become more like advertisements for content rather than a news item that was sort of carefully curated for a viewership. And uh, so we've, we, I, you know, yeah. I think the friction point is like one of the biggest um, aspects of this conversation. Before you had to make full use of every resource that you had and everybody was expertly trained to really think through scientifically, methodically, you know, with the integrity of, of portraying something as truthful. And, and you only get a chance to do it the one time right, the right way. You take a good picture. Great. You took a terrible picture. Sucks. You have to print. Yeah. Um, and yeah. you only have one event. Now we can yeah. take a billion, we can take, okay, not a billion, but I could take a thousand pictures in one hour yeah. without uh, destroying my memory capacity before you yeah. can only take 12, 16, 20, whatever. 24, 36, yeah. Sit. So, so that's the one. The second is the medium, you know, before you had to type it and it was going to be uh cast and printed uh in a limited series and distributed locally and people are going to know if you're telling the truth or, or you're or you're fibbing you know now i could take a picture with my phone upload it to my computer upload it to social media whether i make up things or not who's going to be the wiser oh yeah there's no there's no friction point now well and then now it's even worse with the llms because they're going to just sort of you know they're mashing up all this information that it's found without really um um having any sort of grounding to truth it, and there's a lot of researchers working on this trying to figure out how do we match knowledge graphs more to llms how do we do how do we create conditions so that we can we can kind of verify that that a pro like an LLM process is uh, is not going to say things that are completely um, not factual. But it it's a, it's a bit scary. With the right prompting, you could make up any story about anyone. You can take anyone's name, 
you can write a prop that says, you know, uh, can you tell me this, you know, can you tell me about this? There was the case of the professor in, uh, in Oregon or somewhere, I think, who it was like, can you, uh, you know, what's the story with this professor? And, and it completely fabricated a, because what it was doing was just grabbing some, you know, well-known story that maybe had been reproduced many times on the web about a professor who was found guilty of some sort of, probably some sort of sexual crime or something, and then, or, you know, inappropriateness with a student or something. And then it just matched that with this person's name. It was completely irrational. It didn't match the person's name at all. And, and you can do this now with ease. You can create this fabricated information. And if you, and now what's, what's even scarier is that you have trying to figure out these trust models. It's like, what is a trust model? It's like, how can you possibly have any sort of model where, you know, who's going to trust who to say that they're telling the truth? You know, I, I feel like I've reduced a lot of my conversations with people have gotten completely re gotten reduced down to, you know, messaging or especially like signal messaging or something where I have someone's phone number. They have my phone number. We know each other. We trust each other. If we introduce somebody to each other, we that's can, trust. introduce. you know, that's trust, right? Person to person, human to human. And I think we're going to need to go just, you know, pivot back to that a lot more because there's just so much, um, so much out there that, um, you know, it's like you want to, you want to see whether, you know, do seven of my closest friends know this other person <laughs> and then maybe I'll trust them, you know, something like that. Right. That trust models are really, uh, really, I think they're going to be a very, very, very important part of the next, you know, five years. I think is trying to figure out trust models. So. I think the, work, the I think the work you're doing is incredibly important, and I think that we need to disseminate the training on how to do this at scale. Train the trainer on how to do this for mm -hmm. scientific applications. Yes, we we really can't do anything about um, the the everyday person because they themselves are going to be doing what they want to do, how they want to do it with the advancement of technology, uh, deep fakes, uh, fabricated images, uh, leveraging proprietary data sets. Um, you know, uh, what, what else do they have? Uh, you know, Instagram or Snapchat filters to obfuscate the, you know, your, your face to look like a tiger or whatever. Mm -hmm. We're so far gone with some of the things that we just need to cling on and en enhance and entrench ourselves in the areas the truth is most important. You know, mm -hmm. biology, botany, um, things that really rely on accurate information that needs to be tagged that requires an expert's uh, oh, opinion, yeah. expert's perspective. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I feel like that's another thing for the next decade, maybe. Hopefully. I mean, I, I, I would like to think it, but it seems like every year I think, oh, this will be the year when this when this precision will be important. This type of precision on on images will be important. And then you know, computer vision makes another leap. And it's a kind of like, well, what is going to be the thing that what, what's going to be the thing that that is the cap on what computer vision can can the limits that computer vision will have? I don't know. I mean, I, I it always surprises me the next incarnation that happens in computer vision. Um, but it does still seem obvious. Like when I upload an image to to chat GPT, I can't have a conversation with ChatGPT about that image. Not actually. You can appear to it can appear to be that way. You can you can um, say, well, what do you see in this picture? And it can identify certain features. A lot of them lack lack depth, and what I mean by that is like depth of field. It doesn't necessarily know whether there's a cat in the foreground and a zebra right. in the background, things like that. I mean sort of the relative size and distance things that we do as humans that's a little bit more of a 
mysterious process vision wise like the the type of information where we're processing simultaneously to be able to interpret an image is um quite complicated and you can't necessarily do all that with pixel data exactly although mm -hmm. again like I, I keep being surprised by the next levels of of the of the um the industry but um um it's still it's 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 not gonna it, the thing that people say you know context it's all about the context you don't really know uh you may be able to describe the pixels in an image can you describe the context about what they're really related to and what's the importance of that and the only person who really knows that is a subject matter expert that's sort of what my tool is about is it's about taking deep descriptions and then creating those deep descriptions into entities once they're entities you can do all kinds of information with those those entities because then they can be mapped into graphs that maybe have a lot more uh, a lot more facts associated with that particular entity you know um if i say that something is a picture of dolly parton i now have i'm now connected to several data sets bbpedia and wikidata that you know can tell you like how many grammys she's been has won and been nominated for and when she was born and what day she wrote you know um the two famous songs she you know jolene and 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 um will you still love it like um the one I, I will always love you i mean those two she apparently wrote those on the same day <laughs> you know amazing things okay those facts can be associated with that one entity and if you use that one entity to describe an image then you can you can have like an entire set of of data that you can then sort of leap open. through right and and linked yeah. open data yeah linked open data, linked open so data. that's right so move through time and space and facts and events that's right, that's right. Um, margaret it's been a lovely time chatting with you uh who should get in touch with you before we conclude the the ama i'm sorry what was that who should get in touch with you oh my goodness anyone with uh interesting collections that they want to describe and and both do keywording, um, any type of data, accessibility data, keywording. But more importantly, what I do is keywording with attached to entities. So uh, it's all about anyone with collections that want to address them and with very precise metadata is um, who I so, love to, love to talk with. And um, uh, and and also any machine learning slash uh, you know neural net type deep learning experts who would like to work with a knowledge graph uh, that has one images that are already uh, copywritten so that you can test out different ways of filtering out the images that shouldn't be in the included in the data set as well as like how to use a knowledge graph and ontology of image description to um, to make generative AI actually better and 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 llm type work even better um question answering about images i'd love to work with some other researchers on that and uh, i think that's about that's what we're doing if, so. if i'm not going to limit you to domains but i will just paint a picture of domains that would really benefit from your expertise cultural heritage i think cultural would be heritage. good um automotive Mm -hmm. Are Ar artifacts uh, or collections of artifacts mm -hmm. like museums and things like that? Uh, mm -hmm. Well, uh, library libraries and archives. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to enrich their repository of knowledge with uh, interconnected uh, entity linking. You know, identifying an entity and then finding a way to link it through every instance of that um, in photography or otherwise. Um, yeah, and biology, scientific applications. I think that'd be lovely for people to get into contact with you because you're you ground yourself on the truth. So mm -hmm. that's what that's what yeah. scientific applications need. Truth. Yeah, truth. Yeah, it's a t it's a touchy subject philosophically, but it but that's what I'm sort of into. Yes, exactly. So um, yeah, it's been a pleasure. So and Take and one of these days we'll do a, a an intro to image snippets as well, an actual. Like, um, coming soon yeah, this we year. Do, we do.
we could do some sort of webinar about that, how to use image snippets. Yeah. Uh, so that'd be great. Okay.